Let's shoot. Yeah. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to give a talk today on uh, how to get things done in Haskell. Um, it's aimed more towards beginners, I would say, and intermediate programmers and to advanced uh, Haskell users. Um, and so I've given this talk before, so if you've already uh, seen it some way, I'm very sorry. Uh, nothing I can do about it. Um, so I've been uh, writing Haskell uh, for a while. Um, I'm using it at, at my day job. I also do some open source and uh, I'm involved here in Zurich with uh, Zurihack uh, and also with uh, Summer of Haskell and uh, currently Google Summer of Code uh, for Haskell. And um, so in this talk, we're going to um, basically, if you're a Haskell uh, beginner, you sort of start out playing around with GCI um, you write a few uh, list comprehensions, you write sort of really uh, more advanced programs like 99 bottles of beer on the wall. Um, you try to implement some simple Unix tools like Rev, which uh, simply reverts all the lines in a, in a file. And sort of do, through doing these uh, simple exercises, then there's this sort of mythical uh, question mark bullet point thing. Uh, and then you end up writing web applications in Haskell and compilers and all these sort of nice, uh, nice and useful things. And so the fourth step is really, um, I've put it as a mystery here, but what it, it really is, there's no magical bullet, it's just writing lots and lots of Haskell code and sort of getting, getting used to it and uh, basically experience, although there are some, uh, some shortcuts of course. And there are some things, once you know about them, they're easier to avoid doing, doing things uh, in a particular way. Uh, so I'm going to try to, to help out with some uh, aspects of number four here. Um, but as I said, there's no magical bullet, no sort of uh, magical answer. Use this moment and everything will be, will be fine. Um, so yeah, I've called it uh, getting things done for obvious reasons. And so one of the things that um, I recently saw, on, I think, well, recently, maybe a year ago on uh, social media uh, for Haskell um, was this, uh, this thing they call the Haskell pyramid. And it's sort of this, um, this visualization of uh, knowledge about Haskell, um, which is visualized as a pyramid. And then at the bottom, you have the sort of the really, the really simple things mm -hmm. like list comprehensions. Uh, you can build on top of that with map uh, and filter. Uh, I consider these a bit more complicated because they're higher order functions. So you start thinking about functions that take other functions um, and so on. Then once you've got that under the belt, you can start working with, with IO, uh, writing the files, getting things from the network uh, and so on. And uh, this keeps uh, continuing and it also keeps getting more uh, specific. And then at the top, you end up with this really sort of foreign sounding and foreign looking uh, concepts. Um, and the, one of the problems, I think, if, if you're sort of entering the Haskell community as a beginner or even as a, an, a really uh, good programmer, but you don't, just don't have that much experience with functional language, um, what you see in papers and I guess mostly social networks, like if you read uh, like Twitter uh, about Haskell or you, you're on mailing lists, uh, that kind of thing. What you really see discussed is really the, the heart, uh, the hard parts and the sort of the incomprehensible, very weird looking parts. Um, and it's not to, um, I mean, this, is, this makes sense, right? Because the, it's always more interesting to discuss hard, uh, hard stuff thing, uh, because you're unsure of that. And nobody really wants to discuss the, the easy stuff because it, it's maybe boring to them uh, and so on. Uh, and it's also, it's, of course, obvious that in papers they're gonna discuss these kind of things because it's the very nature of, uh, of papers and research to sort of try and expand uh, our knowledge about programming. Um, but the misconception is really that you need these things to, to write Haskell and that's completely false. Um, what you need to write like a decent uh, performing, uh, well-written, uh, well clean Haskell application is really just the bottom of the pyramid. You need to be able to do I/O files and network. You do meta filter, and um, you don't need um, all the the more complicated stuff, and um, which makes sense, right? Because in any any other language, you're also not going to use uh, prepomorphisms uh, to make a working applications. And the nice thing about Haskell is it's very good to know that all these sort of uh, advanced uh, 
concept. So I'm using this sort of uh, joke concept uh, at the top now, but this also really applies to uh, concepts which are actually useful, like the free monad uh, and variance thereof. Um, it's good to know that these, these sort of things are out there um, because when you're writing an application and you're writing this uh, sort of deep down in the business logic, you come across this really hard problem um, that isn't really easily solved with con conventional uh, ways and it needs to be interpreted in multiple ways. Uh, then it's very good to know that you have these things uh, like the free monad if you need them. Um, but you're not going to sort of start an application and by uh, importing the free monad if it's not necessary, right? Um, so that's one of the, the reasons uh, I like Haskell, um, because you have these, uh, these advanced concepts available, uh, even though you don't usually uh, don't need them. And then, um, so for the purpose of this talk, I'm sort of developing this, uh, this uh, example application. Uh, <coughs> I can show it really quickly. Um, I haven't worked on it for a while and I would really need like maybe two or three weekends to push it forward to where I want to. Um, but basically it's, it's sort of like a, an email service where you can uh, sign up for like a simple, um, simple email uh, address and then I can send a mail here. Uh, maybe if anyone wants to send me a mail so we can, we can see if it's, it's working. Um, and so writing this, uh, so the goal of writing this application in Haskell is really sort of writing an, a realistic-ish uh, uh, application where I try, I mean the code needs to be relatively concise so I can explain it uh, easily so I'm going to refer to this application a few times uh, in my talk and sort of we can look at the source code how uh, I'm doing things. It's also pretty opinionated um, but the, okay, eventually it'll come through. Um, but yeah, it's just, I sort of want to um, sort of test that all these uh, practices, best practices I'm, I'm telling about are actually true uh, and sort of uh, show proof of that. Um, okay, well, I'll try again later. Oh, yeah. here we go. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is sort of, uh, so we'll look at the code of that in a, in a few times. So. Yeah, as I said, it's sort of an exercise in, in doing all things right. So we don't just want to write a Hello World application. Uh, we want to write a Hello World application where we actually care about, for example, having a proper configuration file, uh, doing proper logging, all the sort of things that we normally skip uh, when you're writing a Haskell tutorial because people consider them boring and uninteresting. Uh, but if you want to develop and uh, sort of deploy actually an application, you need uh, these things. So I'm trying to balance that uh, was still uh, keeping things simple. And then this, um, so deploying this is, is really not that trivial because there's a few different uh, parts that need to get uh, deployed. And I think that's so also one of the tests um, really, if you're finished writing your Haskell application or application in any other language, it's sort of a good test to see if you can deploy it easily because it sort of uh, verifies that it's easily configurable, that it's some, it restarts nicely if it's killed. Uh, if there's a problem, you can easily see what's going on because there's logs. So I think this is really a test on, on how uh, on how well you've done things. And there's, I don't want to sort of push uh, too much towards uh, this specific method of uh, deploying. There's many different good methods of deploying. Uh, like you can do it with uh, Nix, with uh, all sort of things like Ansible and so on. In this case, I'm using uh, Docker. Um, because a lot of sort of new ser cloud services expected. I'm not a particular uh, fan of Docker, um, but I think it's quite nice if you consider it as sort of like a, it's like a binary uh, output format that you can just uh, run in different places uh, rather than considering for what it uh, really is, uh, which is a war crime. Um, and then this, um, yeah, so I'm deploying it with uh, the, the thing I work on at my work, which is this um, sort of uh, Haskell-like uh, language, which allows you to really just specify, uh, I want these Docker containers running there uh, and so on. Um, but the important part is really in the, in the Haskell part. And then we, for example, we can check if it's 
if it's doing its job uh, properly and uh, I'm using AWS, but this really applies to all the other cloud providers as well. Um, like if we want to see, uh, my window was a bit small. Currently you're in the middle of the video oh, okay. and you're showing up. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if we can adjust the setup slightly okay, so sure. you can sit. Yeah, sure. Um, because I think actually this cable is a lot longer than it looks. Oh, okay. Um, and then we just shift the table and we can nice. Yeah, I think that's a good position to sit. Then you're still in okay. the video, or you can just stand there. That works as yeah. well. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I'll probably stand. Um, so the yeah, as you can see, we have uh, actual nice logs, uh, which tells us that all sorts of things are going wrong, uh, which is very good to know, right? Um, and um, yeah, so. And my conclusion is here really that it's in order to do these things, it's not really harder than any other language. It's not really easier either. Um, you need to do them in both cases, um, but it's you need to get certain things right. And uh, especially in Haskell tutorials, often skip uh, these sort of things. Um, so it's easy, it's good to do them as a as an exercise. Um, and so, yeah. Now let's talk about some of the some of the ways you can get things done in Haskell and some of the, uh, the patterns I'm using. And so the first thing I want to talk about is Haskell's uh, module system. Um, so most people here are probably familiar uh, with Haskell's module system and it's one of the simplest module uh, system uh, you can imagine. Uh, you have hierarchical uh, modules, which is very important uh, to have that in a, in a module system, of course. Uh, because it means that modules are somewhat composable at least. You have the idea of a module and you can put a module in another module uh, and combine them that way. Um, then you can, modules shouldn't be cyclic in Haskell. You can do cyclic modules. Um, it's usually a code smell. Sometimes it's necessary. Uh, I don't have a particularly strong uh, opinion on this uh, subject, but I've never really encountered um, a case where modules are like inherently cyclic and there's nothing that can be done about it or um, there's the case where two modules have cyclic dependencies and it's really cleaner that way to have them as cyclic dependencies so I've, whenever I've run into this issue I've tried to pull them apart uh, and usually the result of pulling them apart is cleaner than leaving them as a, as a cyclic uh, module so I mean that's anecdotal evidence of course but uh, that's all we have with these, these um, experience things. And you can re-export re a module, which is, which is useful. Um, and you can import modules uh, as a qualified name. And that's about everything you can do with, uh, with Haskell modules. Um, and I think it's a good thing to have such a simple system. I have uh, a deep respect in my heart for OCaml's module system, where you can do all sorts of more uh, advanced uh, things. And also for uh, more experimental languages like 1ML, where you can really, where you really have first-class mm -hmm. modules, uh, and you can sort of modify them uh, as you want. Um, but as it stands, I think Haskell's module system uh, is good enough, and it's definitely better to to err on the the side of keeping things simple. And um, so we can talk about how we can actually use the the Haskell uh, module system. And um, so we start by building this this. Uh, imaginary comment line tool and uh, we start of course with having a, a main module um, then our code starts growing and growing and it's a bit too much uh, to keep in a single file so we have a file for uh, our types uh, called types.hs and um, once that becomes too large we add the utility module uh, util.hs and this is really sort of the classical organization that uh, every Haskeller at some point uh, has used for, for small programs. And um, the advantage is that it's really clear where you should put things. Uh, you put should put types and types, uh, utility functions and utility functions, and <coughs> everything else in main. Um, so that's the advantage. Of course, there's many more disadvantages. Um, and it doesn't definitely doesn't scale very well. <laughs> um, so I think the, the, the real the sort of rule to use here is that things should be used uh, and sort of organized by what they are and sort of their role in the application rather than the sort of Haskell thing uh, that they are because 
uh, for example, types.hs really implies that there's only types there. And if you've ever looked at the types.hs module on Hackage, like it's very rare that there's only that there's only types there. It usually also there's instances, there's like small utility functions. Uh, and so at that point, you're really just sort of lying uh, what the module is about. Um, so I really recommend um, trying to do this by problem domain. I'll give a few uh, examples. So if we are writing this um, simple Unix-like uh, demo, which reverses line with file, um, we can sort of uh, start out by having three modules. Right? We would have the main module, uh, which contains the entry point. Um, so there's really no, no, no way around having a main module, of course. Uh, but ideally, this should be like always as small as possible and just call into your like all the modules. Um, we would have, if we have some options, you can parse, pass on the command line, we would have an options module. Uh, and then for example, the types related to your options would go in the options module. Um, then the sort of the actual business logic, which is utterly simple, of course, like reversing a string would go in a module actually go called uh, reverse and not uh, like types or utils. And um, yeah, so I think, I really think having a types module is a bit of a Haskell uh, anti-pattern, um, but it takes um, some practice to avoid these. And some of the problems, uh, for example, with uh, type types modules is um, instances. And this uh, sort of occurs very frequently, uh, if you ask me. So um, your, you have your types module in which you sort of write this, this type uh, and everything is fine, but then you need to start some instances uh, for all sorts of type classes and Haskell wants you to provide these instances within the same uh, module, of course, to, uh, to avoid orphan instances, but I'll go get back on that later. And um, so we get this situation um, where you have your type, you have uh, a few instances, but then really what you want to do in these instances is use some small utility functions you've written uh, because it's simply cleaner that way or you can't sort of, uh, you can't really put the whole function body in the instance because then it comes too messy. Um, so we're really forced to put these functions in the same module as the types simply because our instances need to use those and the instances need to be in the same uh, module as the types. Um, and this is really the cause of what, why you get these really bloated uh, types uh, modules. Um, yeah, which isn't great, of course. And so um, another problem that uh, sometimes pops up with uh, types modules. So I think it's, and this is also a bit opinionated, but I think it, when you're writing Haskell, it's very good to write lots and lots of data types uh, rather than uh, functions. And I'll, I'll give an example as well. So I've written some uh, words about this uh, before where I can go into it a bit deeper. Um, but to give a concrete example, um, if you have, for example, in the uh, example application uh, I showed you before, you would get some, have some function, for example, to obtain uh, email uh, from a user or obtain email mail based on a specific UUID of the email, uh, something like that. And you could model it as this, right? So uh, maybe it gives you an email back and uh, the first either, and I would note this in some sort of header comment, that the first re either really tells you whether uh, it's an error or not. And then there's a nested either, um, because emails can be either uh, sent as HTML or sent as plain text. Uh, and I mean, like it's obvious from the type, right? Um, but not as obvious as sort of putting like these really small data types everywhere. Um, and this is, of course, the way I recommend. Um, but um, yeah, this is why I say I recommend like adding lots and lots of data types. Uh, almost all functions that return somewhat complex uh, results uh, are easier if you just uh, provide uh, a sum type as a return uh, type. And the same goes for input parameters. Um, you often end up writing these um, functions that take maybe like eight, maybe parameters uh, of different types, where what you really want to do is have a, have a specific sum type. It's only used uh, by this one function, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, the resulting code is, uh, is so much cleaner. Um, one argument you could uh, 
get for the first is that it's it's really great because you can you get all these these things for free uh, like fmap and uh, first from uh, from bifunctor uh, so you could argue that the first is maybe better than the second but i think the second is actually uh, more more readable um, so yeah so this is another uh, another reason to avoid types modules because if you sort of follow the types module uh, to the letter you would also have to put all these auxiliary data types in there and then I mean like you can't it's sort of too big and too perplexing for a user to find its way through your library so that's why you should have like lots of small data types and they should be right next to the functions that uh, operate on them and I think that's a good organization and then you um, put that uh, into the main so as I can see here um, so there are some problems uh, with what I've just told um, for example if you uh, if you have a mail type uh, I'm talking about the example application again and then you have a, for example a parser but you want uh, people to just be, be able to import the mail module and get parse mail uh, for free and you can't really do that because then, then parse parse mail is defined in the parse module and you would want to re-export it from mail but mail really has the, the types, right? Because I, I claimed before that types belong in their, uh, in their domain. Uh, so this creates a cyclic dependency. Um, so this can be solved by um, creating these internal modules, which is something you see like very, very often in Haskell, but it's good to, to know about why they can be useful. Be um, and I think this is really different from, from types. So some people would argue that this is really similar to using types module. Um, but at least we're no longer lying about it because we can uh, put all the, you just put the type there, some simple functions and you can regard these internal modules as really providing like the, not really the user facing, um, the user facing edges of your modules, uh, but really like the internals and primitives on the, on the types. Uh, and then you can uh, create like a nice interface where you can import the internal module in both and then uh, export what you want in the this one. main module. Did you consider moving the parse module also below internal, so mail internal dot parse? Um, because then so it would be clear I that, or perhaps you can't I have some, uh, then we're running the same problem again. Yeah, so I have, I go into that a bit more here. So I think the internal thing is sort of like, a, you can also compose it, right? So you can have, um, so parse can have internals and mail can have internals. Uh, so, so that's how I would do it. I yeah. Don't, yeah. So where I'm coming from is that I often li I personally like um, libraries which organize sort of in a batteries included fashion. Mm -hmm. So I would only import fugacious mail and everything yeah. works and that's what you're proposing. But I'm also, it's sort of confusing that fugacious mail dot parse, I could import that. Uh, but actually, I should never do that. It's sort of, yeah. And I was trying to mark that by actually putting it below internal. Oh, okay. Um, and say, okay, below internal, you have everything that you need to build up. This nice batteries included yeah. interface just of the module above. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I I also agree with that. I think it's some. Um, I mean, in that case, you're using the like the module name to communicate what people should use and shouldn't use. Um, whereas I, I agree with that, but I think people should also be, it depends if you want people to just be able to use the parse module, if they only need that, um, or use maybe like cabal exposed modules and unexposed modules yeah. or hidden modules to, to make the distinction. Um, that would be my question actually, whether you want to have the internal in the name or whether you just use the, the exposed mechanism to do it. And that's actually also addressed here, right? whether you yeah. expose it or not. Which is so I'm, I'm strongly on the side of always exposing internal modules um, because there's, there's been so many cases where you want to like write an instance for something, like for example, a binary instance, but you can't really access the constructor. So there's nothing you can do, but like forking the library and then exposing it and um. Sure, but you, you have the bias, right? That <coughs> you see only as a user of the library, you only see 
the, the cases where you wanted to use something to define something and you don't have access to it and you're, you're unhappy, right? Yeah. But you don't see the other side of, oh, I exposed, uh, exposed everything and now I can't change anything. So I think there's like an implicit rule that if you import something uh, called internal and you upgrade your dependencies and it breaks, it's your own fault. So there's, I, I've had this discussion a lot yeah. with, internal code <laughs> with, issue, right? with Francesco and he made another good argument that actually internal um, is, gives you a stronger way to organize, namely when you're developing, it's really nice to have access to everything. So in a GHCI session, you want to have everything. And with a very simple rule, which says that module dependencies, once you go into production, should never go across an internal. So you don't go up and then traverse down an internal. You actually can organize your code base without any exposed module or so. You can expose everything, but it's still clear what you can use. You have a mechanical check, and you get the full freedom. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, you could do it. You could implement it with prep or it's really just a set of mechanical criterion which you can implement mm -hmm. um, and then put in your CI pipeline. Yeah. So yeah. So I think the only problem is when you initially to continue the discussion when you initially have a version of your library that exposes everything, but it's not really clear that some things are internal and not so. I think the like internal thing things should always always be like really clearly masked as like uh, marked as like internal or like in Haskell like prefix with unsafe, um, and that gives you I think like enough material to blame it on your users if, if anything <laughs> goes wrong. Um, Can you take a step to the left? Yeah. Um, then uh, okay. you're talking to the people on. Yeah, this is also. Awesome. Okay, you're yeah. talking exactly to people on the videos. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so that's about the internal models. Um, then another smell, I think, is utils <laughs> modules. Um, and there's this sort of unwritten rule that every C++ code base contains as many string split functions as there are programmers in the team. I think there are probably the same is true for, for Haskell, uh, since we don't have a split. Uh, like, for example, a split on element equality in, in base. Uh, so this probably the same is probably uh, true for Haskell, and people end up defining these either in their clauses or like in their own modules, but they're really hard to find unless unless you put them in a utils module. But then you get this thousand line utils module in which really really like unclear what the utils module is about. Um, and then um, yeah, so the same is true for Haskell, and really you. Unless you're writing a really small application, you're never really going to have like a top level utils module. You're always going to have like a foo.utils module. Um, and my argument that sort of every function that's now in foo.utils really wants to be in foo, um, but you're not putting it there for some uh, bizarre reason. Um, so the <coughs> there are some problem with util modules. Like you, you probably don't want to import both. Uh, you want to be able to find stuff. Um, and you also want related functions to be to be close to each other. And quite often, things in foo.utils really have nothing to do with the foo either. Um, so, the 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 right solution to this is something that's uh, that's sort of discussed a lot. Um, but um, yes, there are. Okay, so. The, a bit more about the problem set. Like it's not always that obvious where to where to put things. Uh, like for example, orphan instances, or like a string split function. Do you put it where you need it, or you put it in your in your main file? Um, yeah, like byte string of replace is another really uh, good example. Um, and the solution to this is something I've we've probably talked uh, be about before is to use extended modules. Um, in which you sort of take a module, uh, for example, data log byte string, and you uh, say like this function, like replace, I really want it to be in there, but I can't really put it in there uh, conveniently for obvious reasons. Um, so I'm gonna uh, create an extended module uh, and just put the, the replace in there. And this is also where your string split would belong in string.extended. Um, 
if you have like an additional data type belonging to some module, you would put it in uh, an extended module there. Um, and this is also a very good place to put uh, orphan instances um, because the, um, I guess I don't want to go into why orphan instances are bad, but the problem is you, you either put them in the module where the type is defined or where the class is defined. Uh, and this way, GC can check that there's really only one canonical definition of the instance. Um, but by putting them in the in the extended modules, I think we have like a also a good enough solution. Um, since if the the question sort of where the instance is is really clear, it's always in the extended uh, modules. Uh, at least if all the programmers on the team are following uh, our guidelines. Um, okay, so. The conclusion about extended modules is the about util modules. Is we get a lot of uh, extended modules, and another great advantage of this is that we uh, get like a clean source uh, for pull request. For example, I guess it doesn't really apply to byte string, um, but like if you, there's other libraries and you have lots of really auxiliary functions, it's a good grounds for consideration. Like maybe this and this function should really be included in in the library. Um, yeah. Um, so your use pattern is that you only import the extended one? Um, so yes, if there's an extended one, you should import that rather than the... I, I thought it breaks qualified imports. Am I mistaken? Um, if, if you re-export the mode, I thought, I thought this doesn't work across uh, for, for qualified imports. No, this okay. works well. Like you would... Uh, let me go back a little. So you would import data.bytestring.extended, you would import it as I usually import it as just capital B, mm -hmm. and then I can use B dot byte string, okay. and I can use B dot replace. Yeah. Um, and then a bonus you can do if uh, so. There's also applies to prelude. If there's functions you would really like uh, to be in prelude because you use them all the time, uh, and you want them to be available uh, anywhere immediately. Uh, you can put them in uh, in preludes that extend it. Um, for example, unsafe to form my own. Um, so, another thing about uh, qualified um, about modules is you should always design for qualified imports. Um, and this is sort of like a really uh, tricky uh, mistake to make uh, when you're writing Haskell because um, you're sort of um, inclined to write uh, parse mail in your source code rather than parse but you should always try to keep um, keep it domain specific and if you're in the um, if you're in the mail of parse module it's obvious that you're going to be parsing a mail and not the, another sort of document um, and I think so the, the clearest description of this I found was in the ghost style guide which somehow came to my attention um, and the rule is really that if you're you're defining a name and you're using that name really close to where it's defined, then you can re use a really short name. Like just in Haskell, you would use X, or in the uh, mail module, you would use uh, parse. But if you're defining a name, and the goal is to use that name like in a completely other module, or like a completely other subsystem, then you really want a long and more lo longer and descriptive uh, name. And so there's sort of uh, a relationship in the, the length of the name and the length uh, sort of uh, of the span of modules over which you're, you're using things. And um, an example of this, like if we're writing something in the mail module, we would just use parse and then uh, after the code, uh, UT of eight, uh, and it's sort of clear what we're talking about because we're working on the mail subsystem and we have a parse, so it's probably a parse of a mail. Um, but then if we're working on like the web interface of this uh, application, uh, then we, we just import, import it qualified as mail and then we use mail.parse and that way we sort of get the, the uh, qualities that we wanted like about the, the length of the name. Um, so let's talk about uh, another uh, useful pattern to uh, get things done. So this is uh, the handle pattern which has probably also been discussed before in this meetup group. Um, let's go over it again though. Um, so very often we have like really, uh, especially in Haskell, we have like really nice and mathematically sound uh, patterns like monoids and monads. Um, but a lot of times this is not really the case because first of all we have some deadlines. I guess this is the worst uh, 
excuse. Um, but we were dealing with some something that's inherently mutable, so it doesn't really make sense to model it as something that's immutable. Or we need to bind to a C library or something like that, and the C library doesn't really behave, behave like a monoid, so we can't really make it a monoid. Um, and what we were talking about is really sort of, you can compare this to the essence of a, like object-oriented programming. Like you have some sort of state um, inside something that's mutable and you don't want the outside to access it, uh, sort of the internals directly, um, then you want to provide some methods for modifying this, um, this state rather than just sort of modifying the fields. And you want to put these, um, these things together with methods of these. And this sort of sounds like a Java 101 tutorial, right? Um, but this is really the essence of object-oriented programming, I think, in Haskell. And um, not really, we're not going to go into Java 201, so complex object hierarchies or abstract factories of, or all these, these kind of things. Um, but so this is just like a really simple, nice uh, way of getting uh, things done in Haskell. Um, so yeah, there's some disclaimers. It's a, so you shouldn't really use this specific pattern for if you're doing something which is pure, right? Uh, like for example, parsing a mail, uh, or like you also shouldn't use it for just like maintaining a counter or something very simple. Uh, that's often like easy to do in like local code. Um, so there's a bunch of disclaimers. Um, there's also a lot of other approaches which uh, are probably like. I mean, they have other advantages, they have other disadvantages. So it's often like a, a complex trade-off. Um, so the pattern we're, we're talking about is really about uh, how you should write these, these modules that deal with, uh, with mutable things. And um, so I think one of the advantages of having a, a monoid, for example, or a monad, um, you get the laws and you get the optimization rules because of these laws. But what's really interesting to the programmer is this sort of uh, recognition. Like uh, I open some head of modules and I see this weird sort of type, um, but I also see that there's a monad instance. And then um, I can sort of know, yeah, I'm familiar with monads. It probably behaves like this and this. Uh, and as a programmer, it's sort of easier to pick this up. And this is a pattern that works a bit in the same way by always defining things like in a sort of uh, systematic way uh, you get the advantage that if, if, as a new programmer, you need to take over some something, you can really easily find find your way. Um, and so the way this works is the we will always define a, a type called handle, which holds all the the information, all the mutable information. And you can sort of consider this like a file handle or a handle to a socket or uh, something like that. In this example, I'm writing a, a handle to a to a database. Um, the then you just define some whatever functions you want on it. You would have, for example, a create user, a get like get the email for the user, uh, and so on. Um, and then um, to go back on what I was talking about before, the reason we're always calling this handle is because we sort of assume that the user will import this as a as a qualified module. So we really assume that the user is going to to do this rather than. Uh, rather than the second, because the, the second is really if you're writing C or like you're writing a program in languages, doesn't really have a good module system. Um, so that's why we can uh, get away with calling everything handle uh, and giving uh, short names. And um, yeah, so the, the the clear advantage of this this goal is that programmers sort of become familiar with uh, with these with these handles and how to use them. Um, and so we're, we're going to try to do all, whatever we can in the same consistent way. Um, one of those uh, things is sort of initializing uh, handles as well. Um, so rather than sort of taking a bunch of parameters in um, all sorts of different ways, uh, in order to open up a handle or to create a new handle, we're always going to have a config type. Um, and this config type is always called config because people are using qualified imports. Um, so for example, for a database, we would take a file path or something like this. Um, we would also provide like some way to parse the configuration file. Uh, sometimes we want users to create these config data types by hand. Uh, sometimes we want to uh, parse them from JSON. Um, this doesn't matter too much. It really depends on your, 
replication. Um, and um, so another nice thing that we can do with um, these conflicts. So if we're trying to do things right, uh, doing things the right way, uh, and we want to deploy our application properly, then we should support like some uh, some standards, like for example, loading uh, conflicts from multiple uh, places with certain precedences, and um, this works really well uh, with uh, in Haskell uh, with this this approach I'm explaining. Um, so we have instead of having just our uh, a file path in our configuration, we can take a maybe file path, um, and then we can build up a monoid. Um, I'm going to go through this a bit more quickly, which sort of appends uh, configurations nicely. Uh, and we end up with this really useful pattern where we can just uh, concatenate all our configurations together, and then we get our single config, and then we can call uh, the function to create uh, our handle. So this is another um, uh, convention that we always we always call our handle handle we always call the way to create it new and uh, since it's qualified so on. and so it always takes the config and then it might take other handles uh, which I'm calling dependencies so I just there might be more uh, handles so in our case our database handle uh, needs a handle to the logger to log something if anything goes wrong uh, but there can be more dependencies and then it returns a handle in IO um, so in summary, this is sort of what our module ends up looking like. Um, in this case, I'm exporting the uh, config uh, internals, so people can create configurations by hand if they want to, but I'm sort of hiding the implementation of uh, handle. Um, and then I get these actual operations on, uh, on functions. And so this is really uh, my main recommendation uh, for sort of people trying to get to write more complicated and complicated applications in Haskell, uh, like this is a really nice uh, way to get started. Uh, I mean, there are always um, like other uh, approaches we're going to into, but this is like re it's really easy to understand. It works well. Uh, it's fast, um, and uh, so I recommend starting this way. Then there's often um, sometimes there's like a situations in, in which you want to go a bit further uh, and like I was talking about databases before uh, so using a handle to uh, guard access to a database um, this is a good example because you might have uh, different kinds of databases or different kinds of uh, subsystems backing these and um, that's why we, we typically use polymorphism um, and we can sort of split the implementation and there's many ways to do this in a in Haskell, so you can use high order functions to do this. You can use uh, type classes. You can use explicit dictionary parsing, which was what I'm going to talk about. Um, there's the backpack module system, and it's really like an endless um, list of uh, possibilities. Um, but this is also a danger because um, I think in Haskell you have the tendency to over abstract or abstract prematurely. Um, so what you're, you're doing for example in this application i would be writing this uh, this database uh, and at some point i'd say oh this this looks suspiciously like an interface or something that could be generalized um, so then i start creating this type class uh, and then i continue writing the actual implementation but some things don't really quite match the interface so i go back to changing the interface but then that causes problem in other interfaces so i end up with this sort of really weird interface, which has like really specific details for all the implementations. Um, and at that point, it's just like a complete mess uh, of like, uh, and you get into this downward spiral of, uh, of problems. Um, so my general advice, and also because you rarely need this sort of polymorphism uh, in practice. And I always recommend to sort of just try the actual implementations and only after you actually have things together and things work, then you can sort of uh, sort of stare with squinty eyes and sort of see the actual abstractions, right? Rather than trying to predict them uh, beforehand. And um, so what, one thing we can do to uh, apply this to, to handle, um, so the way you could do it and the way I recommend doing it is if you want to abstract things, you can just put all the, the functions clearly in the handle. And then if we look at the 
the type of create user. Uh, it's exactly the same as when we specified it as a top level uh, function. And so this approach of like doing polymorphism by putting these IO functions inside the handle um, is really nice because it first allows you to uh, sort of stub out things really cleanly as uh, normal uh, top level functions. And then when it's necessary, you can replace it by this dictionary. And since the types are still the same, uh, nothing breaks and everyone is happy. Um, so the, you would have, for example, the database module, which provides this dictionary uh, that I showed, and then you would instantiate it in the, for example, the Postgres module. Uh, so the configuration type would still be specific to whatever implementation you're using, uh, of course, because uh, if you have a Postgres database, you would, for example, take a port that it's running on or like a local socket, whereas for uh, an SQLite database, you would just take a file path. Um, so you would have like new functions uh, for all the implementations, um, but then you return this handle, uh, which is really just a bunch of functions. Um, and then, uh, I mean, you can clean it up a bit if you want, if you sort of, if you're opposed to having these, uh, these really long functions inside a definition. Um, but the gist of it is that you, you get these uh, cleaner, uh, cleaner interfaces uh, this way. Um, and then I think I'm going to skip through the next uh, part a bit. Uh, or, yeah. Yeah, I think it would be yeah. good to have a bit of extra yeah. time, even though yeah. this is really enjoyable. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, this is... Okay, so... And I'll finish by, by sort of saying that um, the sort of handle thing I've shown, there's many other uh, approaches to, to accomplish uh, the same thing. Uh, like you want to write uh, abstract Haskell code and you want to have something clean and you want to handle effects. And you see all these uh, sort of approaches posted on mailing lists and so on. And it's really hard to know what's, what the best way to structure your, your application is. Uh, and really the, way, the, the main reason why I I recommend this approach is because it's I think it's always better to uh, err on the side of thinking of keeping things simple um, and if you have this really simple handle based approach it's quite easy to put like a mono transformer on top of it or like a, if you want to do like a free monad or like a small DSL uh, it's not so hard to put to write this on top of the handle whereas if you start out writing defining uh, your database as a free monad it's pretty hard to then create like a simple, more imperative uh, layer on top. And um, so, yeah, just so simple. And then, so another example, like I recently came across like this, uh, this uh, nice example of a type signature. Um, in order to sort of, to, so JSON RPC is just uh, like a way to parse JSON messages from a socket in like a length limited way. Um, and this is the type signature you get from the library. Um, and even like for me as like, a, I would say like fairly experienced Haskell, it's not that easy to figure out what, what's going on here. Um, and you get this, you, you get this mono transformer and um, on one hand, this sort of, the idea is that this would provide like more accurate guarantees and that this would be more flexible uh, than just having like a plain handle. Um, but this is often not the case, and so in the, the actual application where I was trying to use uh, this, um, I wanted to keep, uh, so it's very easy to get, the, to get started with this. You just write the JSON RPC action, like the last parameter, and you write it in the specific bonnet, and uh, you just read something from there, you write it back, you have these convenient functions, uh, and that's all good until you want to say, like you want to have the thousands of these, uh, and you want to put them in a map. Um, like, how do you even get started doing that? And if you have like the simple handle-based approach, it's very uh, easy to do that. But if you have a type signature like this, um, you would need to kept, keep a th like a lightweight thread running per uh, value in your map. And Haskell threads are lightweight, but they're not that lightweight, so maybe you don't want to do that. And so I guess the gist of it is that this sort of way of doing things forces you to to use it in a particular uh, way um, and while 
it's often like a good way to do things. Uh, I try to recommend the handle approach because it's simple and it's flexible. Uh, okay, so that's all I have. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions or have a discussion about this if, uh, if anyone is up for that. Um, but we also have a second part of the of the program for tonight. But yeah, let's take a bit of time for questions. Okay. So um, while I'm more qualified in port, the, the first reaction uh, to your handle is probably yeah. does it get confusing when you have 50 handle types? Um, I know they are qualified in port, so they are all handle. Um, no, I think it's it makes things easier um, because you would always write them as so the type would be called database.handle or db.handle for short um, and then in the like on the actual value level rather than the type level I would just call them database mm -hmm. uh, so in lowercase right because we're yeah. talking about the very level so I don't think it gets confusing um, so very I think this is very similar to the OCaml community where it's very uh, common to call everything just T which is uh which looks a bit weird but once you get used to it is it's fairly fairly easy to work with and yeah. okay. all right cool thank you jasper So yeah, we have a um, quite unique event, actually. Um, I mean, it's been quite some time since this meetup existed, 2011 actually, is when it was uh, founded. And lately, Jasper and I have been working quite a bit for SiriHack. And we realized that there's a very interesting opportunity. I mean, we were prompted towards that opportunity actually by the problem of, oh, we're getting actually sponsoring money, but how do we manage that? I mean, we're just two individuals um, and we don't have it on our bank accounts. So we have a clean solution, so a bank account would be nice. Well, what's the easiest way to get a bank account? Hmm, yeah, we're in Switzerland, just found an association. It requires two people, done. But then we started thinking a bit more and we were like, isn't that a good chance actually? to sort of establish this community or lift it to the next level and really use this as a chance to sustainably organize our Siri Casper community. And before going to the second part, I would like to give you a bit of an overview. It's a quick historical background. So we all sort of talk about the same thing and also see a bit where the problems lie that prompted us to take this step. And then go through this proposal of actually uh, the Zurich Friends of Haskell. What's the purpose? How is it organized? What does the membership mean? And then go through the founding. Um, afterwards, celebrate uh, as usual. Um, we've reserved some space in the pizzeria right nearby. But yeah, uh, before the beer, we have to work. <laughs> All right. So. As said, the, the primary thing that we have been organizing in, in the Zurich Haskell community, which has bound it together to a good amount, is this Haskell C meetup. It was started in 2011 uh, by a guy called Oscar something, I don't remember his surname, <laughs> and he actually stopped quite quickly, but then um, Alex Bernauer took over. He was by then a student, PhD student here at ETH. Um, that's actually the place where I got to meet him, and now he's actually my colleague. Uh, on the, well, he was my boss at Digital Asset. So, we've had a lot of regular talks then. Um, I've linked here to, let me see, I've linked here to the repository that we're using, and you can see there's material from 2011, from the Coffee and Monets meetup. There's some advanced API design, GCRTS, profiling, lots of material. And we're having continuous growth. 
actually, yeah, I don't know how well this. So I also have you the stats here. So these are the stats for how the meetup page has grown. So we're now at 400 members. Not all of them are active, but sort of activity is also growing. What are those pits? Pardon? What are those pits for the Did the pits? I think the pits are when I didn't have the time or neither okay. nobody had the time to organize a talk. Um, I think it's uh, the winter break, right? Because there's always like two. <coughs> Let's see. Zero one. Yeah, we usually don't have a talk around December. Uh, that's probably another December is thingy. Uh, last year, I think here something was missing. And towards the end of the year, times were a bit stressful. Um, so, this time can yeah, and that actually brings us to the problem that it's a really small set of organizers. Um, Alex handed it over to me, and I'm currently organizing most of the talks. Sometimes I get help from Jasper, last year I got a good amount of help from Martin. Um, Ralph is doing an awesome job on actually always organizing the room. It's also just one guy at ETH who clicks the right buttons. Thank you, Ralph. And also the set of speakers is not very large. It's large enough, um, but it's always sort of a, a, a balance to actually get a talk going. What I was always aiming for is that every last Thursday we have a talk so people can reserve the time. Um, and it's a talk that somebody prepared because I really like it that um, you spent this time, but you learned something. And then there's also a small thing, but the meetup.com fees, that's like 60 bucks a year, they're paid by individuals. Um, so this is another thing which, yeah, some people do it, but we are depending on a really, really small set of people. And um, the other thing which has a similar property is Suri Hack. It's the seventh edition. It's quite the institution. It's the largest Haskell hackathon in the world. <laughs> Almost 400 people have signed up for this year. We have a growing set of sponsors. Um, the event is still free, thanks to sponsoring for t-shirts, for speaker travel. So, did you already announce the new speakers? Yeah. yeah. So like, Gabriel Gonzalez is gonna fly in from San Francisco to talk here. It's an awesome opportunity. Um, but it suffers from the same problem. So this is the set of people who have been organizing these seven editions. The people in bold are the main organizers. And all of this is voluntary work. Fine to provide that, but some people get families, so voluntary work is a bit harder to come by. And then also like some connections like Farhan and I having actually done also PhD work together here at ETH, knowing each other and him now actually organizing for us the opportunity that we can do the Suri hack at HSR. I, I would like to move one step further and actually work towards institutionalizing these connections and making it such that it's the Zurich friends of Haskell that have these connections, how we move forward and we build a community which is just built around this idea of functional programming being a really nice paradigm to program, being fun um, and see where we can go. Yeah, so that, to recap, the goal is to organize the core of the Zurich Haskell community, to improve the sustainability, to lower the dependency on key people, so to have more people that know how to run this, and to professionalize sponsoring, to actually be able to take the money and spend it well uh, to further invest in the community. So how is that done? The bylaws of the association are in German. Um, the reason for that is that we want to be able to go to a bank and say this is, these are the bylaws founded as an official association. But in layman terms, or just quite literally translated, it's the association has a clear purpose and that's what defines its direction. The purpose that we've chosen is to foster the worldwide knowledge about functional programming, and in particular the Haskell programming language, with a particular focus on the Zurich area. I like it here a lot, and I think many of you do as well. So, yeah. And 
it's called out that particular things this association can do is to organize events and meetings to foster the, for this purpose. It can also support particular groups or projects. One of them, which you might have heard about, which is, for example, an interesting candidate, just to give you an example, is the GHC DevOps project, which is about making the build infrastructure behind GHC really simple, such that way more people can contribute with way less effort. GHC has exactly the same problem. It's like there's a very small set of people on which you have a key dependency. If they go away, that project is in serious trouble. And there's no religious or political affiliation, just as an FYI. The organization is rather simple. I mean, what I did is actually just copied the standard template for founding an association in Switzerland. Um, these three pages of text, uh, but the simple structure is there's a yearly general assembly in the first quarter of the year. And currently the size of the board of directors, Vorstand in Germany, is three people and they're charged with running the association, following the purpose, keeping proper accounting, um, and presenting a report on the activities and the accounting to the General Assembly at the beginning of the year. There's no restriction at how many times people can be re-elected. Um, so we're reasonably free to focus on this goal of sustaining the community. Um, with the work which we have available. Membership, and that's really important. So the, the membership duty which we're proposing, I discussed that with Jasper um, in depth, is really geared towards the community sustaining, sustaining the community. And to sustain that, we actually mostly need voluntary work. We don't need money. So if you give one Haskell a seat talk, if you help organize Syria in the official role, you serve on the board of directors for the association, or you provide voluntary work equivalent to one of the other options, as discussed with the board of directors, you're part of it. To give an incentive or to give the option for other people that actually don't have the time available, we were suggesting sort of something like 50 bucks as a sponsoring to pay things like meetup fees or sometimes a speaker arrangement, um, just to have a base income, but it's not about income, it's about really having people that feel committed to do probably like 10 hours of volunteer work a year. It's not a lot. And yeah, so there's also, there's a huge benefit to that, but it's immaterial. It's to sustain and shape the community that you care about. Uh, it's written in bold, but I want to repeat it because it's really important to us. Membership is not mandatory. The events that you organize are meant to be free. We want to foster the knowledge, but we want to also organize the core of the community to keep being able to do that. That's actually all, that's, that's the pitch. So the steps required today to make this actually reality is to go through the founding protocol. Um, use, there's two things which need to be decided, board of directors and membership. Sign up initial members and then have a small little party. Cheers with beers. Um, the pro steps actually until March 30th is that the board of directors will take in on them to complete the founding. So set up communication channel and website, um, welcome the members, in, inform them on the ha about how to contribute and set up the bank account to manage the sponsoring because Hack is coming soon. 8th of June and t-shirts need to be ordered, speaker travel needs to be arranged, so yeah, there's a few things to do. But before we go to this funding protocol, are there any questions, suggestions? Mark? Um, what, I, what I wanted to ask is just, um, didn't you think about uh, to broaden it towards Switzerland? Because what I was thinking that uh, there is a year from the uh, constricting part and uh, since this is already like and they are also doing a lot of um, language, um, um, formal language theory related research and stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I just had a thought that maybe this yeah, could be. It's, it's, it's a very good thought. Um, and I, I personally spent quite a bit of time on, on debating that. So, like, for example, College Zurich Friends of Haskell, College Friends of Haskell. And I thought that the important part is really it's. It's nice to get together. It's nice to be in the room with you guys. 
Um, and I was thinking, let's first focus on organizing this and allow other chapters, like there could be a Lausanne Friends of Haskell, more than happy if they just copy verbatim what we did, more than happy to collaborate, because the purpose is to foster the worldwide knowledge. But the organization is like, okay, we make sure that we sort of get Zurich as a safe base, and then we see how the work develops. Right. Yeah? That's a very good question. So, I mean, up to now, the contributions of companies to the Zurich community was via sponsoring of Zurich Hack, uh, either in money or in, in kind, like HSR provides the venue. Um, there's, I don't think there's any exclusion. The um, issue is that the numbers need to be natural yeah. persons. Or yeah, that yeah. is handled in the bylaws, all people and organizations. Um, and yeah, if an organization wants to be a member for the 50 bucks, then <laughs> <laughs> um, again, it's really the purpose defining it. And I think it's, we, we have to find out over the coming year or years on, on how to organize that well. Yeah. I would actually expect that to, to be easier. If, if you have some kind of a legal entity, right? If that mm -hmm. uh, some kind of company wants to contribute, mm -hmm. it's usually much easier to convince, you know, whoever you need to convince inside the company, uh, if you have some kind of a legal entity mm -hmm. instead of having, you know, just a few yeah. five people. Yeah, I think so as well. I mean, contributions welcome. Also, I mean, currently we have the, the Haskell C meetup and we have Surrey Hack. If there's people that are interested in organizing something more in the name of the association, more than welcome. Just talk to the board of directors and uh, align that. It's whatever, whatever works to foster this purpose, let's do it. All right. So, yeah. Is the fax useful? That is a very good question. <laughs> That's actually what I was just debating with uh, our proposed accountant, ha! back there, Matthias, <laughs> offered uh, that he would step up as, as the accountant. So I, I, I was reading up in the background while, while the talk was. Um, it, currently, the Statuten, or the bylaws, um, we moved, uh, so don't state explicitly that we're not um, nicht gewinnorientiert. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. So we, we are currently not a non-profit organization, but I'm thinking we could actually add it because I checked that sponsoring is still possible. I, even though, as far as I understood, it's a oh, video. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll check it properly. Um, <laughs> up to my current knowledge, <laughs> it is such that um, even a non-profit organization has to pay taxes on certain um, income. So, like, if it's sponsoring because the company gets a recruiting exposure, then that is normally taxable income. Uh, but you can still, if you're non-profit, you can still have tax deductibles. So I'm gonna amend uh, uh, bylaws to be non-profit, and then that's another thing which we'll figure out with a bit more time. Um, but that's expectation. Should be tax deductible. What's your stance? Oh, I was just, I mean, if you want to amend them, would it make sense to found it when we have all the, those details, if they are down? Because otherwise you have to call the General Assembly to amend them, probably. Um, you're probably right. Mm. <laughs> um, and we can found the, the, the club actually just with two people and then invite others. Yeah, then go for membership. <coughs> would make more sense before. Yep. 
Otherwise, everybody who signs up as a member today, then we have to call like in two weeks the general assembly for all of the changes. <laughs> good, good. We have two weeks notice period and all the other stuff. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I was hoping. I, I don't know, I was playing a bit by ear. Um, I was hoping to use the momentum of the day to get a few signatures more. Um, but actually, that makes sense. I would still use one of these papers and the backside uh, to get down the email addresses of the people that are interested. Um, because the next step, which is also important to me, is that we actually fill the talk slots for this year. Um, I've, I've been usually fighting to get them filled uh, and I think we can do much better and particularly if you know that you're up back then you will prepare uh, if you choose a project that is of interest to you it's well spent time so, question mm -hmm. yeah? besides the, the non-profit status is there anything that is uh, unclear not really I mean we had um, one lawyer look through um, the bylaws and suggest corrections. It's also they, they're based on a template which is on the official template. Uh, but I think Matthias is nevertheless right that um, let's make it such that we have them watertight, uh, as, as watertight as you can do an interaction with law. Uh, yeah. And also probably quite a few people of you didn't have time to, to look through them. So if you want to do that, then also again. We, today we have a sign of interest, a letter of interest, or signature of interest, and we'll follow up then. I think, given that, I would still like to discuss in this forum or just double check these membership requirements. So that, that's the proposal. Um, but let me make this a bit bigger. Yeah, it's sort of around 20 would be a good number. Because you're not probably aiming for the um, like 400 uh, No, no, it's, it's a huge, huge problem. <laughs> like organizing it every week. I don't think the, the size is a problem. Um, but if, if I, I guess the, one of the questions is, what's the gut feel on, on this 50 here? Mm. It's essentially the 50 that's incentivization to either provide the volunteer work or don't go for dinner once or twice. All right, then sounds like we should go with that. And then the other thing is the first suggestion would be that actually Jasper, Matthias and I uh, would serve as the board of directors. Um, and the current bylaws, what they say is that um, Vorstand here is re-elected, if I remember correctly, every two years. And we organize ourselves, except for, yes, we organize ourselves. Good. I think then uh, we just do a sort of a sign up. So I remove all of this. Um, and I suggest people just come by, put the signature down and their email address and you'll hear from us once we're done. Any more questions, comments on this one? Here. Yeah, for the sign.